History has recorded the facts of Apollo 16 as the fifth man mission to the lunar surface. But the facts don't tell the whole story. The crew accumulated more memories during their 11-day flight than most people acquire in a lifetime. The mission was commanded by veteran astronaut John Young, with rookies Charles Duke and Thomas Ken Mattingly. This is their story. The story of Apollo 16 actually began in the days just before the launch of the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission. The prime crew of Apollo 13 originally consisted of James Lovell, Fred Hayes, and T.K. Mattingly, while the backup crew consisted of John Young, Charles Duke, and Jack Swigert. The prime crew of Apollo 13 spent years together training for this mission and were prepared for the flight of their lives until fate altered their flight plan. Two days before they were supposed to go, um, Charlie Duke, who was on the backup crew, uh, was exposed to the measles, came down with the measles, and of course then exposed everybody in the prime crew. And Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes had had the measles when they were kids, but Ken Manningly, who was the command module pilot, had never had the measles. So the doctors bounced him from the flight and replaced him two days before blastoff with a guy named Jack Swigert, who had been his backup. I mean, and, and they had never done a crew change that close to a flight before, never did it again. I had everything to do with TK not flying on Apollo 13. But had he gotten German measles on the way, on, out when he was out there or on the moon or around the moon, uh, that would have been horrible. Uh, it would have, he would have been, could have been sick, he could have been life-threatening and from the standpoint of the mission he could not have would not have been able to perform having concentrated seven days a week 24 hours a day on an event that's uh, suddenly denied for what you know you, you feel is an unreasonable reason even though intellectually you know that it's a it's a sound decision uh, emotionally you, you feel like uh, you've been cheated from something important I don't blame Tom Mattingly for being upset about it because I think he knew in his own mind that he probably was immune and that it wasn't going to be a problem, but we had no way of proving that. And uh, I've apologized to him profusely many times since then, but I think he's gotten over it. On April 13, 1970, only two days after the Apollo 13 mission began, one of the oxygen tanks on board the spacecraft blew up and ruptured the backup oxygen tank, causing the spacecraft to lose electrical power, water, and oxygen. This forced the crew to use the lunar module as a lifeboat. Astronauts Young, Duke, and Mattingly worked feverishly for five days straight with thousands of fellow astronauts, engineers, and scientists to help bring this crew back alive. The Apollo 13 successful return was a brilliant demonstration of human ingenuity in a life or death situation. Mattingly's contribution to the success of bringing his friends back alive certainly did not go unnoticed by NASA management. Deke Slayton, head of the astronaut office and in charge of the crew selections, made sure that Mattingly's actions were duly acknowledged. I don't remember the what the regular sequence was. It was like three flights. If you were back up from one, you would expect to fly as a prime crew on about three flights down the, down the chain. I don't know when, but not too long after the, the mission was over, why Duke told me that I have another, another chance to, to go fly. So, so I still came out of being pretty lucky. And, and in retrospect, while well, we know I came out very lucky, Young, Duke, and Mattingly continued to work loosely together for about a year until they were officially designated as the prime crew of Apollo 16. The Apollo 16 mission objectives were to land at uh, Descartes in the Lunar Highlands and to, to bring back the rocks, uh, put out the uh, Lunar Scientific Experiment package and do all the things you had to do in three days of exploration of the surface up there. But John Young was a 
was a test pilot. Test pilot still is today. And you got everything out of John Young that you could ever ask for. If you asked him to do something, he was going to get it done. You know, because he does things uh, the right way, the best way, and gets what you ask for. Charlie Duke is very much the same way in terms of, uh, of responding to people's re requirements. Charlie Duke also was one of those guys that had a very great sense of humor. And I think that he was a natural uh, adjunct to, to uh, John Young. A, a typical day in training uh, for us is a hard day. Uh, we got started early in the morning. Uh, generally, uh, we'd have four or five hours in the simulator. Uh, we'd uh, then uh, spend an afternoon in uh, lunar surface type training, uh, putting on our suits and practicing either getting suited up in the lunar module or either going out on the simulated rock pile we had down in Florida to practice putting our experiments out. Being able to uh, find the kinds of rocks of interest among all the various kinds of rocks up there we went through a lot of training exercises to teach them to recognize rocks that we thought would be interesting. Well, we went to several places where rocks are exposed well, basically in the western United States. We went to Hawaii and looked at, uh, looked at volcanic rocks, basaltic rocks out there. Those were the basic areas we went to. We'd had a lot of training in geology. We'd been, actually, uh, Charlie Duke and I had been trained for lunar geology for, since 1960s early 1960s so we had a lot of uh, a lot of training and pretty much knew what kind of rocks to pick up but I was just talking with uh, one of the guys who worked with Charlie Duke uh, and John Young on the 16 crew and he was describing an incident where uh, when we did our training exercises we had the guys wired with radios like they were going to be on the moon and they were talking to a back room and they started screaming about how they really found this really neat rock and how there was really life on the moon and what they found was a rattlesnake. And when he got up there, they were kind of jumping around and jumping away from it. It was, it was quite amusing. It was... Another aspect of the training was the preparation for the long treks ahead in the innovative lunar rover. After the shakedown tests done on Apollo 15, this rover would allow Young and Duke to go further and faster than ever before on the lunar surface. The rover was a really a unique car. It was electric. It had two batteries. Each wheel had its own electric motor, so it was four-wheel drive. They had a double steering system. In other words, you could steer with the front end and the back end. It had a handle that sat between the seats that was uh, the, the total control over it. You, you push the handle forward to go forward, pull the handle back to put on the brake. If you wanted to turn left, you push the handle left, and the car, of course, turned left. Uh, it was a highly maneuverable machine. We had a centrifuge rig that put you at 1 6 gravity. I ran 13 miles or something over there one time just to see, just to prove that you could get back in case you ran out of, in case your lunar rover stopped driving, that you could still get back. While Young and Duke were spending most of their time simulating their anticipated experiences on the lunar surface, Mattingly was busy setting records in the command module simulators. One of the things that uh, I, I think is one of NASA's major accomplishments is in preparing flight crews, they, they have these simulations which are extraordinarily realistic for the ground controllers and for the flight crews and for the team as, a, as, a, as an organized group. And I think that's the key to why they've been so successful. And he was good. I mean, we're like, he was the world record holder for hours in the simulator. I mean, he had simulated this flight for a couple of hundred hours. You know, he was ready. After having spent well over two years in training and about 2,000 hours in simulators and test facilities, the crew was finally quarantined in anticipation of their historic mission. One of the funny things that happened during a flight, I have a twin brother named Bill, Bill, and Bill's a doctor uh, in our hometown in South Carolina. Before the flight, uh, we were in quarantine. My brother had come down with his family, was staying at the Holiday Inn in Cocoa Beach, and 
and he's walking by the pool and there's all the NASA management there, Rocco Patron and George Lowe and a few others. Uh, and they looked at him and their initial thought, we found out later, was this guy's broken quarantine. What's Duke doing out here? He's supposed to be in quarantine. So uh, they called up out there, what's Duke breaking quarantine? And, you know, the guy picks up, well, he's right here. What do you mean he's not breaking quarantine? So we had everybody have a big laugh over that. Once young Duke and Mattingly were strapped in, there was nothing more that they could do but sit there and ride on seven and a half million pounds of thrust once the launch began. Their heart rates that were monitored in mission control proved to be higher during the launch than at any other time in the flight. very nervous people. Charlie Duke, Ken Mattingly, and me. People said that when that vehicle left the ground, it shook so much that the ground vibrated. You couldn't prove it by me. I was sitting in the top of it. I think my knees were shaking. But there again, it was vibrating so much you couldn't tell. But I remember the vehicle really started to shake it from side to side. It was just a slow acceleration as it lifted off. It took 10, 11 seconds to clear the tower, and I thought they'd never say tower clear. Uh, and the whole time it was shaking like crazy. I thought there was something wrong with it. I didn't know whether it was going to uh, get uh, go in orbit or not. But uh, John was real cool, and he said we're go, and uh, sure enough, uh, we went uh, shaking like crazy during the whole first stage. After the crew fired their engines for the Translunar Insertion, or TLI, the main spacecraft containing the crew, known as the Command and Service Module, detached from the fourth stage rocket booster and turned around to pick up the lunar module that was tucked away in the booster. When we turned around and saw the lunar module, uh, it was uh, uh, like that, and those flakes coming off, uh, the, it uh, was really uh, scary. We thought we had a fuel leak, uh, but it turned out uh, we didn't. The crew settled down for their three-day, 240,000-mile adventure to the moon, while still looking back over their shoulders 
at the planet they just left. If we looked out the window and the Earth was in our window just like that in the blue in the black black ground and it started to get flat, you no longer saw it in three dimensions. It's about that time when you're going to the moon. I personally and the other fellows that were with me, we started to wonder if we hadn't bitten off more than we could chew. They'll talk to you about the Earth more than the moon, more than anything else. I mean, they'll talk poetry about what the Earth looks like as you're getting 10,000 miles and 20,000 miles and 50,000 miles and 100,000 miles and, it get, and, and everything you have ever known. You know, I mean, like the whole history of the human race is getting to the point where you can cover it up with your thumb. And that's a very powerful psychological force. After three days filled with anticipation, the Apollo 16 okay, crew finally reached its destination. Young and Duke okay, entered the lunar go. module Orion, go, while Mattingly go, stayed go, in the command go, and service go, module Casper. Just after the lunar module detached from the command module, Mattingly tested the main engine's primary and backup steering systems before he was to fire the engine to correct the spacecraft's orbit. Mattingly found that the primary steering system worked perfectly, but when the backup system was used, the entire spacecraft unexpectedly oscillated violently. The failure of either primary or backup Always steering systems was cause for a mission abort. If this problem proved to be a system failure, then the crew would have to return home immediately and hope that the remaining steering system would not fail as well. They get them back together, get the things back that they want them, get them mentally prepared to do what they're going to do. But now don't take that as input. I'm talking out loud. I didn't want to say something unless I'm sure. I don't see any way we can continue on. Okay. It looked like we were going to abort, and you can imagine the, uh, uh, the disappointment we had at this point uh, to think that we were going to have to abort the mission. We'd come through 240,000 miles, and we've been uh, uh, training for three years almost, and here we are eight miles away from our landing site. We can see it, and they're about ready to tell us to come home. you confirm forward on me? I just don't much see how we can make it on this next trip. I think you guys ought to continue to work. You'd, so you'd only do it if you had a failure on the primary. Well, how would you ever get the damn thing trimmed then? Well, I would, I would, if I had a failure on the primary, I'd shut it down. With the near-fatal Apollo 13 mission still fresh in everyone's memory, all of NASA's engineers, astronauts, and contractors immediately swung into action to either help Mattingly solve the problem or abort the mission and get the whole crew back home safely as soon as possible. So they started uh, looking to see what the options were from a trajectory point of view. In the midst of this, uh, some of these simulations uh, started to surface in the back of people's minds. Uh, we had another rule in the simulation that's important to remember that you never quit until you'd reached a stable or a safe position. You know, uh, while things are out of control, no matter what the simulation was scheduled for, you would continue to run it until the team had found a solution. Meanwhile, Young and Duke were sweating things out in the lunar module, not sure whether they'd have to abort the mission and redock with Mattingly in the command module, or if they would be able to continue with their mission. For about uh, four or five hours, I figured we didn't have a prayer at land on the moon because of that engine. We were going to have to turn around and come home as quick as we could. It was discovered that a broken wire in the backup system caused the oscillations and vibrations. Mattingly would have no real troubles in steering once the main engine fired. After a lot of nail biting, the crew was given the green light to proceed with a lunar landing. You do have a go for another try here. From the time that we would see the spacecraft on its final pass as we moved towards descent until the time we had landed the moon was about 30 minutes. 
We had about 15 minutes to take a look at the spacecraft, make sure everything was go. We had the proper tracking information, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the systems were all go, and then we would go through their final series of checks and make the commitment to start the descent to the moon. Take over, Charlie. Okay. Okay, fuel is good, 10%. That comes a shadow. Take 200 feet. Crew is, is oriented, and they actually start uh, performing what we call as a retrograde burn. They're slowing uh, their, their orbital speed down, so the lunar gravity starts pulling the spacecraft down towards the moon. Perfect place over here, John. A couple of big boulders. Not too bad. Okay, 80 feet. Down at three. Looking super. There's you see the shadow stop. That means he's leveled off. Okay. And you see the engine blowing out the dust just uh, everywhere. Because the moon is covered with dust, very, very fine like powder. The little black rods you see below the landing pads are uh, uh, electrical probes. And when they let the uh, hit the moon, they turn on the lights at contact. You shut the engine down and you dropped in the last four feet. And it was like Yahoo Houston, old Orion is finally here. But on Earth, with that, all that equipment on and a backpack, we weighed 360 pounds. That's we trained in, trained in Earth at the block field, as you saw in that film, a lot. And you could barely move your big okay, toes. But when you're on the moon, and one, you only weighed 60 pounds, so the jump was delightful. There we go. One of their initial responsibilities was to set up the first space-based telescope, known as the ultraviolet camera and spectroscope. This allowed scientists for the first time to photograph deep space objects without the interference of the Earth's atmosphere and prove beyond any doubts the many advantages of the moon becoming a perfect base for astronomy. Another experiment package that was to be deployed was a heat flow experiment that was to measure the movement of heat from the moon's interior to its surface. Both Young and Duke have performed the setting up of this experiment hundreds of times in simulations and had no doubts as to its ultimate success. One of the big experiments, uh, drilling a hole into the moon while John is working on the power station. Uh, unfortunately, as he walks away, if you'll notice his left foot, uh, he gets his foot uh, caught in one of the cables, and, and just right there, he ripped it loose. Uh, unfortunately, that was the electrical power to the experiment I was working on. That cable, 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 oh. cable. Watch the cable. Cable number one. Heat flow. Pulled it off. Kind of sorry. I didn't even know it. I didn't even know it. That was something I've done many times in training, and they said it wasn't like that. But they fixed it for Apollo 17. In fact, in Apollo 17, when Jack tripped over the central station, they drug the whole thing along. Didn't hurt anything. So they fixed it real good. We should have had it fixed for Apollo 16. There's another case where you find out something in training and you don't do something about it, it bites you. Perhaps the most visually spectacular aspect of this mission to the viewing public back home was when the crew took their rover out to sites far beyond where they landed. Here I am getting in the car, and we jump up and uh, land on the uh, car seat. Uh, then we had to buckle our seat belt because the ride across the moon was rough. 
Uh, no roads up there, uh, but fortunately no traffic either, so uh, uh, you just let her go. And the object is not to run over any great big rocks or to run in any great big holes. Uh, we set the moon speed record on Apollo, uh, at least we say we did, which was 11 miles an hour, uh, which was a, uh, it felt like we were literally flying. I think that uh, the thing I remember about Apollo 16 was John Young driving that rover around the, the uh, surface of the moon trying to figure out what its capabilities were, driving and turning that thing around corners and driving it like it was a, a Le Mans race. That was, I thought that was fantastic. All the traverses were designed so that the furthest point away was early in the traverse so you'd still have the oxygen to get back in case you did something like knock a wheel off a rover. Always a possibility in those block fields that you could go in there and tear the axle right off. Before I went to the moon, uh, I had this dream uh, about uh, we were going across the lunar surface, actually driving north in the car, and we'd driven a mile or more, and when we came over the ridge, there was a, another car, similar to our car, with two shapes in it. It looked like two astronauts, and it was just sitting there. Uh, all this is all in my dream now. I ran over there and pulled the visor up so we could see who it was. And as I pulled the visor up on the person on the right, I was looking at myself. Turned out astronauts were dead and... Charlie didn't tell me that dream before he went and I was glad he didn't. <laughs> oh, and I don't like to have known that. There's a rock in the near field on this rim that has some white on the top of it. We'd like you to pick it up as a grab sample. This one right here? That's it. This, this one right here? That's it. You got it right there. Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a football-sized rock. It's a great Scott size. You sure you want a rock that big? Even though Mission Control yeah. had Young and Duke working hectically to accomplish their duties by picking up moon rocks and setting up experiments, there was still enough time to take advantage of their unique view of Earth. And that's what you can see when you get on the moon. The Earth is 230 or 40,000 miles away, and when you hold up your thumb like this, you can, you can only see the blue clouds, the blue surface and the, and the clouds, and you can hold up your thumb and cover up the Earth. And if that doesn't worry you, well, nothing ever will. And I do remember one time holding my hand up and, uh, and underneath my hand was the earth. Uh, and a thought passed my mind that, you know, underneath my hand is five billion people or four billion, whatever it was in those days. And, and that you don't see uh, North America or Europe, you, you just see earth. And I discovered that uh, just seeing earth as one doesn't make us one. It's, you gotta have a heart change inside. Uh, and that's what is going to make us one, is that we, we get a, a change of heart. And only God can do that for a person. While Young and Duke were busy setting up experiments and collecting lunar samples, Mattingly was busy in the command module conducting 15 experiments on his own. Along the way, Mattingly also set the U.S. record for the longest solo flight of 81 hours and 40 minutes, a record that still stands today. The command module pilots, I mean, like, stayed in orbit all by themselves, half of which they were on the dark side of the moon and couldn't even talk to Earth if they wanted to. So they had plenty of time to kind of sit back and just look around and realize, wow, I'm at the moon.
You know, they carried music with them. You know, every astronaut was allowed to carry a tape with their own favorite tune. And I know Ken Mattingly on 16 um, carried classical music. I mean, like, he, he was a, a big fan, and he picked out songs that he thought would be appropriate to space travel, you know, like Host Suite for Planets and the theme song from 2001. And, uh, Symphony Fantastique, and he's listening to the Symphony Fantastique floating around behind the moon. You know, that's the kind of thing that a command module pilot got to do. You know, the moonwalks, they invited the families to come to Mission Control. So we went over there during the seven hours, three days for seven hours, and watch the, the moonwalk. It was really great to be able to see it on the big screen at Mission Control. Toward the end of each day, I would start, my heart would start beating a little bit, saying, oh, now it's time to get in. <laughs> get in there before anything happens. We have a few minutes left, so we decide to do the moon Olympics. I decide to try to set the high jump record on the moon. And as I start to do that, I bounce a couple of times, and then I fall over backwards. And as I fall over backwards, fear strikes. If I split my suit open, I'm dead. As John helps me up, I get very, very quiet as I listen to the pumps and the oxygen flow in the suit. Fortunately, the suit holds and my fear subsides. The size of that big, it is a big end. It may be further away than we think. No, it's not very far. It was just right beyond you. And we better press on for the big boulder. Okay, we're headed that way. You get the tongs, uh, John? Yep. It was characteristic for all astronauts to be visually unprepared for adjusting to scale or distances on the moon. Because of the moon's much smaller size, the horizon drops off much quicker than on Earth. And there are simply no landscape markers or geological points that the astronauts could judge distances with. Probably is. Okay, that sounds like a good guess. Look at the size of that rock! The rock that Young and Duke thought was just medium sized and not too far away turned out to be as large as a house and ended up being much farther away than anyone had expected. They aptly named it the House Rock. Well, Tony, that's your house rock right there. Very good. Don't get too near the edge of that thing. It falls off. Look, look over, look over at your right. It falls off pretty good. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Keep going. <laughs> During the mission, there I am bouncing around on the moon, and my brother walks into mission control. Uh, he gets a pass, and he goes. He wants to sit on the flight the flight uh, surgeon's console, and. Uh, a few people knew he was coming in, but I mean, the whole room looked over, I understand, looked at him, and he looked at the TV, and they looked at, you know, and they thought they were, what's happened here? And then all of a sudden, they realized uh, uh, they were got around by his brother. He looked at I mean, we're almost, we are identical. Uh, that uh, created a few stares and a few laughs in this control. Just before Young and Duke had to go back into the lunar module for the last time, Duke left a small token of himself and his family on the moon's dusty surface. An idea we had uh, before the flight to just to get the whole family involved was uh, to have a picture taken. So we had a picture taken of, uh, of our family in the backyard of our house on the back of this photograph of our family, uh, we wrote something to the effect of, this is the, fast, this is the family of astronaut Charlie Duke from planet Earth, who landed on the moon in uh, April of 1972, and so I pitched it out on the moon and took a picture of the picture. After being on the moon for about three days, and having spent three EVAs, or extravehicular activities, collecting over 200 pounds of moon rocks and other samples, both Young and Duke entered the lunar module for the last time and prepared to take off for a rendezvous with Mattingly in the command module. 
This is a ascent stage uh, sitting on the moon just before lunar liftoff. Uh, the top, the top part of that machine goes, and the bottom part stays on the surface. That's very interesting too. We know that there are 200 ways that the lunar module engine could fail to start. It was a pretty tense time. Think of that: 200 ways to become the first permanently manned lunar base. It's the only part of the entire vehicle that had no backup. You know, I mean, because like NASA was very safety conscious. Every system was double redundant. They had three of something, you know, I mean, but they only had one engine to take off. And so they made the simplest engine they could build. You know, I mean, it was a very simple and straightforward engine. And he turned it off and it went on, hopefully. Okay. Smile. F.A.O. Don't be mad. We'll get it up there. See how nice and leisurely it's been? That's the way it should be, getting ready for ascent. Ten seconds. I was starting to form this thought. It didn't, it didn't light. Just then the engine lit, and it bang, it kicked us. And then from then on, it was a wild ride. It was like riding a fighter plane. And uh, it was just... And it was some ride, man, it, 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 feel this baby go, and it, that was the feeling we had then. It was just exhilaration, riding this thing back in orbit. And right there is the descent stage, and back there is the rover. And if you look real close, you can see tire tracks and footprints all over the place. But if we accept the uh, thing that the president said we would do, more human solar system exploration, you know, it won't be too many years before somebody would be wanting to pave a lunar freeway right through this place. A lot of people think that we went, did all this moon work in a secret movie lot in Arizona. And this proof positive that we were there. And of course, I have the gray hairs and so does Charlie Duke to prove that we were up there. Uh, especially the old timers in South Carolina, you know, they, yeah, we did it with mirrors in Arizona or something, you know. It's amazing how many people don't believe we actually went to the moon. And I tease everybody. I say, well, I don't know where they sent those other guys, but I know they sent me to the moon. <laughs> Once the crew of Apollo 16 was reunited, the samples and experiments collected in the lunar surface were transferred into the command module. The ascent stage of the lunar module was jettisoned, but its movement afterwards became unstable and unpredictable, requiring the crew to take evasive action to avoid a collision. Before leaving the moon's orbit, the astronauts released a six-sided satellite designed to orbit the moon and monitor the solar wind, interplanetary magnetic field, and deviations in the moon's gravitational pull. Shortly thereafter, we turned our uh, spaceship around so we could see the moon. And the moon literally just began, we were climbing so fast, the moon just literally just began to shrink just like that. And you could see it. I mean, literally, a whole satellite that big, 2,000 miles an hour, just began to shrink like this. And that was really spectacular. And then we had to settle down for the three-day trip home. But that first uh, hour or so, was, uh, we were glued to the windows <laughs> watching that. While on the outbound trip to the moon, Mattingly lost his wedding ring after searching in vain for over seven days he had given up hope of ever finding it. One of the crew's final responsibilities was to retrieve the film canisters of photos Mattingly took of the lunar surface and experiments that were conducted while in lunar orbit. With Duke standing in the open hatch, Mattingly conducted a one hour and 24 minute tethered EVA. It was during this EVA that Duke saw the ring float out of the spacecraft. And so I float over after it and try to grab it and I miss it and it floats outside. Uh, and well, my first thought, well, lost in space, there it goes. It floated out and hit him on the back of the head, which he didn't feel, of course. Uh, I watched this thing hit and instead of bouncing off and cartwheeling off into space, it hit and came straight back towards the hatch. It floated back in the hatch, and I grabbed it on the rebound. After a relatively uneventful three days, the crew prepared to return back to Mother Earth 
heavily laden with film, experiments, and moon samples. I think we've seen as much in, uh, in 10 days as most people see in 10 lifetimes. mission this is true we've always had I won't say it's a superstition uh, if you look at a lot of the hype you see in TV and movies we they see us celebrating virtually every event in the mission that is not the case we celebrate only when the crew is safely in Apollo on board the deck of the carrier basically we hold back until we are absolutely sure that our job is done then we will sit back and we will celebrate You saw an example of goal-oriented teamwork in action. The kind of thing that made this country great and the kind of thing that's going to keep it that way. Thank God for America and thank God for this country that has let us work in such a marvelous program. Then we passed around cigars in this thing here. This is when we we could smoke in the control room. People would do this, and we'd light up the cigars. And that was, hey, our thanks to the team. And there was a, just a feeling of uh, togetherness, uh, bond, unity, accomplishment. Uh, it was just uh, the most marvelous feelings in my entire life that existed in this room. Well done, young man. Outstanding. I am. I cannot touch that cigar anymore. I cannot. The house was full again. The champagne bottles were ready to pour it. At this point, they did. They just popped the champagne bottles as soon as that splash came, and we were celebrating. Cigars came out of mission control, but we had the champagne. The whole mission in uh, Apollo 16, we, I added up one time when we finished, we had more than 100 different problems. M main highlights were doing the job in the face of all the problems that, that we had. It was uh, proof that you could get out there and do it and uh, do the complete mission in spite of problems. Uh, we had a lot of problems, but that's the, way, that's the way life is, I think. Solving problems in real time is what this bunch around here is really good at. After the successful conclusion of this mission, the crew went on a brief celebration trip around the United States and were received like the heroes they are. I mean, the country was really nice. My hometown had, I mean, they put on a great big celebration, Charlie Duke Day, and, and we had a little town of eight, 9,000 people. There must have been 40, 50,000 people show up and, and in every community around, and the governor was there of South Carolina. And everywhere we went around the country, we just got a wonderful reception. And that was nice to be an American, to, to have been involved in a program that people are proud of, that brought the country together rather than split the country. John Young went on to become the commander of the very first shuttle mission in 1981, and also commanded a second shuttle mission two years later setting the record for the most trips into space. 
Young decided to stay with NASA as the special assistant to the director of the Engineering Operations and Safety Division at NASA's Johnson Space Center. His 30 years of service as an astronaut was recently honored when he was awarded the Outstanding Leadership Medal by NASA's administrator, Dan Golden. Recently, John was asked why after such a lifetime of achievement, after so many other astronauts have retired, that he still came to work at NASA day after day. And he said simply, because there's so much left to do. T.K. Mattingly stayed with NASA as well and also commanded two shuttle missions in 1982 and 1985. After leaving NASA, Mattingly entered the private sector in the aerospace field and is currently the vice president in charge of the designing and building of Lockheed Martin's X-33, the next generation of NASA's spacecraft. Charles Duke left NASA shortly after his flight and became a very successful businessman. Perhaps the most lasting effects of Apollo 16 are the implications of what this mission meant to people of the world and long-term prospects for the future of humanity in space. I prefer to believe that the challenges, things that are stimulating, are the kinds of things that make societies healthy. I think that you cannot retain a healthy society without giving yourself some kind of a challenge to draw the best out of you. I thought when we left the moon that we'd have a base up there in a couple of years, and a, and, but we didn't do it. Uh, I think it's time for us to look at going back to the moon now. Where right now the United States is where Columbus was 500 years ago. The time is to get out there and, and discover these places, um, investigate and expand our knowledge, and then apply that knowledge uh, to solving problems here on the Earth. We need to get smarter and we need to learn better how to control our destinies and I think uh, space exploration is a key, a key to that. I know I thought that I probably would uh, have aspirations going to Mars. Uh, somewhat naively, in retrospect, I, I assumed that we'd go to the moon and then just press right on to the next destination. The future of humanity may well depend on our ability to conquer space. This Apollo 16 crew and the program as a whole laid the foundations for all that followed. When I look up at the moon, uh, especially on a real bright, clear night, and it's uh, you know almost full, it's a uh, there's feeling of uh, had a boy. You know, I've been there. You know, and it's uh, it's still a thrill just to look up and. Uh, still look up and say, you know, that's where I was, and, uh, and it uh, just, the memories just flood through my mind, and uh, it uh, still brings back uh, lots of excitement.